To me, it's ultimately stewardship. Yes, I love being healthy. I love being pain-free in my body. Mm -hmm. I love having no meds that I take. I love that. I have a commission. Mm -hmm. I have a calling. I want to be able to give mm -hmm. and run and serve until it's time for me to go home. Not mm -hmm. that I, I cut it short because I like peanut M&Ms too much. We know we have to fight battle for sexual purity. There's so many other ways we're, we're careful about, we're conscious of, but the thing that's going to kill most of us, more than tobacco, more than alcohol, more than drug use overall, is bad food habits. And yet that's the thing that we, we just never talk about. We've got to warn, we've got to speak the truth because it mm -hmm. is life and death. And something I learned early on, like when God set me free from drugs, and other ways where he's intervened in my life, I've learned when he's carrying you, don't play with it. When you're mm. flying, don't play with it. When, when he's giving you supernatural grace, don't play mm. with it because you don't want, you don't get it all the time. And when you mm -hmm. do, you don't want to abuse it. Welcome everyone to this episode. I believe today's topic is going to challenge many of you. It's also going to plant a seed of God's truth, hopefully uh, leading to change in your habits and in your lifestyle. Here at our ministry, we have a group that we call Fast Forward Challenge Group. We regularly take time to fast. Every year we start with a 21-day fast and many of you have been exposed to the teaching on fasting. But fasting is not a the only method to living healthy because the benefit of fasting is really the spiritual more than physical. When it comes to the rest of the time that we don't fast, we have to have a biblical perspective and have a proper view on food. We know that food is a gift from God. We know that it gives us strength and also gives us satisfaction. And we know that gluttony is bad. It's an excessive ongoing act of eating or drinking. It abuses our natural desire for nourishment. It's overindulgence and overconsumption of food. And as I like to mention a lot of times that many people have made stomach into a God. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame, like Paul says in, in the Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, and they set their minds on earthly things. And today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Michael Brown, who wrote a book. This is not a recent book, but I do believe this message is very relevant to everyone on the breaking the stronghold of food, conquering your food addiction. And he not only wrote this book, but he has a powerful testimony about this. And so I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. So Dr. Michael Brown, I'm so glad that you wrote this book and I'm so glad that you're sharing this message. Oh, I'm so glad you want to talk about it. And you better believe it's absolutely relevant. My wife, Nancy, and I wrote the book and every single day, it's a conversation we have with people asking us questions and wanting to know what we were able to do that brought about such a radical transformation. And I see your stories. Sometimes you're doing push-ups at your age, how busy you are, and you're showing off doing push-ups and, I mean, seeing how you look and how you are. There has to be a secret. You were not always like that. What was your life like before you broke the stronghold of food? All right, so I, I weighed about 100 pounds more than what I weigh right now. I'm, I'm in the mid to high 170s now. I was in the mid to high 270s then at my wow. worst. I loved the Lord passionately, served Him earnestly, worked out intensely, and traveled around the world, did two, uh, did two hours of live radio five days a week, normally wrote about five op-ed pieces a week, always working on one or two books, uh, traveling internationally and nationally, pushing, going for it. And yet, all these years, I was a food addict. All these years, I was a chocoholic. All these years... I was putting stuff into my body that was gradually killing me. I can't get into details, but in the years now of eating healthily, as different things came up, kidney stone or something, because once you got an MRI, we discovered that problems in my arteries, if I had continued eating the way I was 10 years ago, I, I would have been dead not long after that. I would not be alive today talking about it. That's how destructive it was. But, but I didn't know. I was, I was willfully ignorant. So I had several headaches a week. I just thought, whatever, just pushing hard, maybe not sleeping enough. I had constant lower back pain. Uh, my cholesterol was as high as 240, but the bad was way up. The good was way low. Uh, my blood pressure was now high. It was as high as 149 over 103. And uh, I had sleep apnea at that point, severe. Had to travel everywhere I went around the world with a, with a, a breathing machine, a CPAP machine for sleeping. Uh, so I was committed, running hard, loving the Lord but food addicted, 
My favorite meal was pizza. I grew up in New York. Used to have pizza every day, sometimes twice a day. Chocolate always. And I would, I would try to break this at times. I did a 21-day mm-hmm. water fast, just surrendering to the Lord, which sometimes only have sweets one day a month and kept that up for months. But I'll always fall back. You know, we give mm-hmm. up fried foods, whatever. So I was always fighting, but always mm-hmm. losing. And ultimately, every few years, I put on a little more weight and didn't take it off. And, mm. and I finally got to the point of tiredness that I, I said to Nancy, I don't think I can keep up this schedule. I was only 59. I say only 59, wow. about to turn 69 and, and feel like I'm a 20 year old, but I was only 59. And I said to her, I, I don't think I can keep up this schedule any longer. And she had never heard me talk like that. And it deeply concerned her. Hmm. Now, before we talk about a little bit about the theology of food and the importance of why this is spiritual, we're not just talking about here looking better, feeling better. There's actually a theology behind that. So if you can give us a teaser of, so there's a big shift that happened, which we're going to mention that in just a moment. How are you doing now? Oh, wonderful. Thriving. I have not had a headache for nine and a half years. The lower back pain, 100% gone. My blood pressure average is about 100 over 65. My cholesterol is about 135. The good is way up. The bad is way down. Uh, I, you don't travel I with the sleeping machine? Don't need a breathing machine anymore uh-huh. at home or on the road. And uh, I, I was working out with some 20-year-olds uh, not long ago. And one of them just was a bit overwhelmed. He hadn't slept right the night before and hadn't eaten. And, and so he was a bit overwhelmed and he was struggling and at the end of the workout. And my wife said to me afterwards, she said, honey, you can't work out with guys in their 20s. It's, it's not safe for them. So I'm, <laughs> I'm thriving. I feel like I'm getting younger every year. I, I thought she would say it's not safe for you. <laughs> yeah. It's not safe for no, them. No, seriously. So I, I'm, I'm thriving. I'm blessed. I'm full wow. of life, overflowing. It's, it's amazing. So it's not just, and here's the thing. To me, it's ultimately stewardship. Yes, I love being healthy. I love being pain-free in my body. Mm -hmm. I love having no meds that I take. I love that. And I love being here for my wife, Nancy, and our kids and our grandkids. But to me, ultimately, Vlad, it's a matter of stewardship. I have a commission. Mm -hmm. I have a calling. I have a mission from God. I have Mm -hmm. more to give now than ever as I'm older, hopefully wiser, more mature. I want to be able to give Mm -hmm. and run and serve until it's time for me to go home. Not mm-hmm. that I, I cut it short because I like peanut M&Ms too much. So to me, it's ultimately a matter of stewardship. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's so encouraging for um, young people like myself and as well as other people that are watching. Um, take us into that season. And you alluded to this, that you were exercising and you actually would uh, try fasting, not tr- for this, but you were fast. And, and then you would actually try to go for a while without you know, consuming junk food. Talk about the sense of impossibility, the feeling like it's just too hard to change the food that you eat. Yeah, so th- this is the deal. I-, I would just tell Nancy, I can't take any more pressure. Like mm-hmm. I'm under enough pressure it is. I'm, I'm constantly under attack on social media, tackling controversies, going day and night, constant deadlines. I can't take any more pressure. I'm great within this bubble that God's called me to live in, but you mm-hmm. add one extra thing, I can't have that, or on the road, don't eat this, skip this. It's like, I can't do it. And plus, what am I gonna do? I'm flying around the world. I'm traveling 40 plus hours to India. What am I supposed to do for food? What do I do when I get somewhere? I'm at the airport, it's the only thing. So I could not mm. take the sense of extra pressure on me. Mm. Plus, when you've tried, people say to me, Dr. Brown, you're so disciplined. On the one hand, by God's grace, I'm super disciplined like a machine. On the mm-hmm. other hand, I tell them, if I was so disciplined, why was I a chocoholic at the age of 59? If I was so disciplined, why couldn't I give up simple foods that I knew were destructive? Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's, you got to eat every day. We're in a fast food society mm-hmm. and my body was addicted to it. It's that simple. And I just, certain point, you think you're fooling yourself. However, here's my self-deception. I'm Mr. Positive. I'm Mr. Optimist. Today's good. Tomorrow's going to be better. So every day I would do the same things and expect different results. I'd get on the scale in the morning frustrated, like, oh, why didn't I lose weight? Well, you didn't lose weight, stupid, because you did the same thing every day. But I would live in this kind of self-deception mm. that it's going to fix itself. And when mm-hmm. Nancy would tell me, you got to do something radical, I wasn't willing. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20, which deals with sexual immorality 
have to do with how I eat. It's about purity, but you're also referencing about that in your book to food. Yeah. It's 100% in context about sexual immorality and, mm -hmm. and purity, flee sexual immorality, etc. But it ends in verse 20 by saying, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, in some translations, in your spirit, which are God's. So this body does not belong to me. My mm -hmm. whole life does not belong to me. I've been bought with a price. I belong to him, to God. Jesus paid for us. That's one. Two, I'm to glorify God in my body. So mm -hmm. let's say you had a very expensive car that was going to be involved in, in, in races and you know that you were, it was an official race car for Ferrari and you put that in my care. I'm not going to put cheap fuel in that that destroys the engine. I'm not going to mm -hmm. forget the oil change. So there's a responsibility that we have as stewards. So mm -hmm. am I honoring God with my body if I'm a glutton? Am I honoring God with my body if I'm willfully, knowingly eating things that are going to cut my life short or inhibit my ability to serve him? Mm -hmm. am, am I doing my will or his because I'm bought with a price so we live to do his will? Or are we doing his will with our diet or our will? Wow, that is so important because many of us would take that verse and only apply it to sexual immorality. But when it comes to gluttony or overeating you know sometimes uh, dr brown i you know look to christians and i say you know we we make fun of or we, we convict condemn people who go to the bar when they are overwhelmed and when they deal with stress but we somehow justify that we run to the fridge and you know we look to the taco to be our friend to be our comfort food and and we have this unhealthy relationship with food where we use it to comfort ourselves, especially when we are stressed out and, and anxious and not realizing that we are hurting the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, you mentioned also in your book in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 4 through 27, where Paul deals with spiritual discipline. And, uh, and though that's it's about spiritual discipline, it's not about food. But how does that apply to our eating as well? Oh, it's really, so verses 24 to 27 in 1 Corinthians 9 are about discipline in all things. Mm -hmm. so, so Paul says, don't you know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. So run so as to receive the prize. Then he says, those who compete in the games. So in Corinth, they didn't have the Olympic games, but similar kind of games there. Those who compete in the games go into strict training. So mm -hmm. you know how an athlete lives and the self-denial and the pushing themselves because they're Olympic athletes and they know every little millisecond or bit of strength or it's all going to make a difference in the race. So, they do it, what, for an earthly crown. But then he says, but we, meaning we do it for a heavenly crown. Mm. Now, we often just emphasize the difference between the earthly crown and the heavenly crown. But Paul's saying they are disciplined in all things. Why? To win an earthly crown. We are disciplined in all things to win a heavenly crown. That's why he says, I, I subdue my body because mm -hmm. I don't want to be a castaway after I've preached to others. So this is about discipline. In every way, it's not saying you need to be a weightlifter, a bodybuilder. It's not saying that, but it's saying just as an athlete to win their race, to win the prize is disciplined in all things. So also are we disciplined in all things. So we know we have to fight battle for sexual purity, massive mm -hmm. battle in our culture with porn and everything else. We have to fight the battle for discipline in other areas of, of, of our lives, not mm -hmm. wasting time, watching the words that we say. So many other ways we're, we're careful about, we're conscious of, but the thing that's going to kill most of us, more than tobacco, more than alcohol, more than drug use overall, the thing that's going to hurt most of us, cause most diseases, problems, is, is, is bad food habits. And yet that's the thing that we, we just never talk about. And, and it's important I say this, I have no condemnation for those who struggle because I struggled 59 years and I loved Jesus during that time and he used me. And, mm -hmm. and I know how hard it can be and how many are frustrated. So there is no self-righteousness, compassion, truly. I live with this deep sense of gratitude. God, you just helped me. Nancy mm -hmm. really, really prayed and cried out to God for me. I prayed as well, but she really felt this burden. She knew my life was being threatened, really prayed. All I can say is God had mercy. So I, I have no condemnation to others, but we've got to warn, we've got to speak the truth because it mm -hmm. is life and death. Mm -hmm. You mentioned eight things 
that we have to realize and accept where we have to shift our mind about food. What are those eight things? All right. So the list in our book, Breaking the Stronghold of Food, one, overeating is sin. Jesus forgives that. Jesus died for it, but recognize it's sin. I don't mean one time in, in, you know, in 10 years, you had a special family meal and you overate a little. That, I'm, I'm talking about the habit of overeating or overindulging the flesh. It's mm-hmm. a sin. Jesus died for it, but it's a sin. A second, Do you have a measurement, uh, Dr. Brown, where you would know that it's like where it's overeating? For me, it's really never an issue anymore be- because mm-hmm. I only eat certain amounts of food. And when I have massive salads, it's hard to overeat a salad. <laughs> but, but I would say this. If the way we're eating is keeping unnecessary weight on us, if the way we're mm. eating is producing health-related problems, if the way we're eating is causing weight gain above our ideal weight, then that, that eating is sinful. Along with if you're stuffing yourself just because it's so good and you know mm-hmm. that you're about to you know, fall over, that's the mm-hmm. obvious. But that's eating that's not healthy, I don't just mean mm-hmm. the nature of the foods, but the amount of the foods, That would be sinful. Then, yeah. Um, yeah, so fat does not define you. Uh, many times we, we just get so much into body image and we get stuck in that and we can't get out of it. So maybe you're a glutton, maybe you're fat, maybe you've struggled for decades. Uh, I was not a glutton as much as an unhealthy eater. Nancy was self-confessed glutton, but that doesn't define who you are in God. So get a healthy view of who you are in God and then that can help change the habits and exterior. Third, critically, important, understand you're an overcomer in Christ. Mm. Yes, this is a stronghold, but Jesus in you is greater. When, mm. when Jesus instantly set me free from drugs, December 17th of 1971, and I said, Lord, I'll never put a needle in my arm again, which was shooting heroin and speed and cocaine and any other drug I could, I could put in my arm. When I said, Lord, I'll never put a needle in my arm again, I was instantly set free from that moment on. When it came to foods, I went through three miserable days of withdrawal, miserable. The third night I cried out and said, God, you set me free instantly from drugs. Surely the power of your spirit is, is more powerful than a, a, a chocolate glazed Dunkin' Donut, you know, so help. So we are overcomers. Uh, four, grace empowers you to live above sin. The same grace that helps you say no to adultery, the same grace that helps you say no to, to gossip and lying, the same grace can help you say no to unhealthy eating. Mm. Uh, next freedom through obedience is a choice that it's not just going to happen one day. I'll feel, no, no, you have to make a choice. Once you are convicted, this is wrong. You have to make a choice. That's how freedom comes. Spiritual warfare over food is real. Uh, I had a caller the other day, Vlad, and he said, I- I'm trying to witness the power of the Holy spirit in my life, but sometimes I don't have enough will to say no to a cookie. I said, well, that's not the easiest one. You know, <laughs> discipline over food is very challenging. There is yeah. real spiritual battle. And mm-hmm. aside from, you know, strongholds where there could be demonic warfare, just the physical, mm-hmm. mental, emotional addictions, very intense. Mm-hmm. With God, all things are possible. I'm, oh. I'm living, look, we're, we're not talking a day here. We're talking almost 10 years now, mm-hmm. well over nine and a half years thriving by God's grace. And here's the deal, no exceptions. In nine and a half years, I've not had a, 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 an M&M. I've not had a, a donut. I've not had a slice of pizza. I've not had a French fry. It's just, wow. I've, I've, I've been free. I, I'm talking about clean eating, living mm-hmm. by God's grace. And then lastly, uh, healthy eating is cooperating with the Lord. Uh, you know, I had heart conditions that came to light after uh, I got hit with COVID. Right towards mm-hmm. the end of COVID, I got hit with it found out that I had uh, a serious AFib and had been having it for some years. Didn't realize that when they did all the checkups on me, when I was in the hospital for a night, they found that, you know, one part of the heart was badly developed. So that was all the result of decades of unhealthy eating and probably the sleep apnea also. So mm-hmm. I had this procedure called an ablation, like, oh, over a year and a half ago. So everything's been perfect since then. I felt God gave me a, a brand new restart. Mm-hmm. But I regularly... Uh, check for AFib. I, I don't believe I'll ever have it again, but in consci- mm-hmm. being conscious before God, because by doctor's recommendation, I'm, I don't need to take any meds or anything. You know, I'm good and clean. My mm-hmm. lifestyle is great. But out of conscious before God, I check uh, most days. And every day I see just the even heartbeat. And I think, what a miracle. 
this thing that God created. I, uh, I, I have very little medical knowledge. Nancy's much deeper in it than I am. Mm-hmm, but the mm-hmm. way he made the body, the intricacy, wow. it's, it's so extraordinary. And you put the right things in, you get the right results. You put the wrong things in, mm-hmm. you mess it up. It's like, no, cooperate with the Lord. Your life will be so much more enjoyable. Mm-hmm. You'll bear so much more fruit. You, you'll honor the Lord so mm-hmm. much more. It's, so we're cooperating with him as we do this. You know, it's interesting that a lot of us, especially in the charismatic Pentecostal circles, we, we believe in the power of healing and divine healing, but so many people have not discovered divine health. Yes, sir. Obeying God's word, uh, obeying some of the common sense things. We're not just talking about uh, something super complicated, common sense things and seeing how believers live today, um, even myself included. In this area, I need a lot more improvement. Ever since this fast we just came out of, there's been a lot of conviction in, in my own heart. My wife is the one uh, that's a lot more healthy. And I come from a family that, that we lived healthy, but now living in the United States in the last 23 years, the kind of food that we have, and you quickly you develop an appetite for that. And then you just begin to pack weight. I remember one time when I was um, still a youth pastor, my pastor, my uncle, um, he rebuked me. He said, um, you're growing fat. And I'm like, what kind of a correction is that? I'm like, he should be talking about my heart, not about my weight. And he's like, you're supposed to be a soldier in the army of God. And he's like, your belly is, is you know, the king king exalt, the king is becoming too exalted, the king's stomach. And my pastor kind of g- gracefully, but he said, Vlad, he's like, you have to get um, your weight under control. He's like, you're very young. And he's like, once it starts accumulating, it's very difficult to stop. Yeah. And he's like, stop it now. And he's like, do whatever you need to do, live a disciplined life. And so um, so what you just shared, these things, and I love how almost in every reference you highlight the importance of depending on God because I know quite a few people who are struggling with this and they've done, you know, everything under the sun and they just seem to not be able to break this stronghold. You mentioned and you go in detail about the whole idea of get thin quick schemes, weight loss gimmicks. And <laughs> have they helped you? Are there any shortcuts to good health? No shortcuts, but I tried them. And Nancy really wanted me to put them in, in the book. So it's, it's embarrassing, you know, but I get these new pills. If you just eat these every day, then you don't need fruit because you're getting all the fruit that you need. Because I virtually never had fruit. I have, I'd have a, a tiny little salad each day, most mm-hmm. days. Uh, and, and then almost no fruit. And, but if you take these pills, it'll supplement that or eat what you want. And as you sleep, this will like mm-hmm. increase your tab- metabolism. The most, the most embarrassing, the most embarrassing. Remember, this is Dr. Michael Brown doing world ministry. I'm flying one day and I, I see this ad, this anti-fat cream that you just, you put it on <laughs> like your fat legs, you, you slime it on there and it'll help reduce fat. So I bought it but I, I, I hid it in, in part of the bathroom where I thought Nancy wouldn't see it because I was too embarrassed even to tell her about this scheme. And um, I remember putting on the first time is like this greasy goop. So it sticks to your pajamas or it sticks to your bed. It's like, so I used it a few times. And so, but I tried the stuff. It, does, it doesn't work. Here's the miracle. You get rid of the bad foods. You eat only healthy foods. Join that with exercise and your whole life will change. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what your background is. It just works. And, you know, probably from what I understand, 95% of most of the diseases that we battle with in America would go away if we ate healthily. And there was a colleague, a friend of Nancy's that, that worked with someone who, who wrote, uh, Dr. Joel Furman, this doctor, uh, she worked with him. And, and we follow his guidelines, his eat to live guidelines. And mm-hmm. she said, I would be in these, these diabetes work, uh, groups where people mm-hmm. would come with type two diabetes and with doctors controlling things, you know, checking their levels and all this over a period of days by eating healthy food, getting rid of the unhealthy, they would be weaned off insulin. And by the end of this, this retreat that they were at, they were insulin free and could be insulin free for the rest of their lives. She said, I saw more people healed of diabetes during that than I saw in my entire life being prayed for in charismatic churches. We're talking about type two diabetes. In wow. other words, it's, it's 100% diet related. We may have genetic issues, but if the dietary mm-hmm. changes are made, these things go away and it feels like a miracle. 
but it's really mm. not. You, you see your blood pressure drop. You see your cholesterol level out. You see all these, these aches and pains disappearing. And it's like, how'd that happen? Because God made the body the certain way. And when you put the right things in it and get rid of the wrong things, you mm -hmm. get results that seem miraculous. There are no shortcuts. Give it up. Give up the idea forever. I used to think reading a book about dieting would change things just as if reading it, something magical would happen. And it's just, it's, it's a myth. We live in self-delusion because we love our food. And in your book, you talk about the diet mentality versus permanent life change. Yeah. And um, now what triggered that life change? It's a radical life change. You've tried this before, but on Sunday, August 24th, 2014, Yep. Uh, was it just one thing or was it a series of events that led up to this key decision uh, that happened on that August 24th? It was a series of things, but it happened suddenly. Mm -hmm. What happened was, on the one hand, Nancy really got burdened. She had changed her own life prior to that. She was different than me. For her, being fat paralyzed her. She didn't want to leave the house. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to be around people. She didn't want to do stuff. Uh, it just paralyzed her. And she was just achy from head to toe. For me, it didn't stop me from anything, except I, I was killing myself, but it didn't stop mm -hmm. me from doing anything. God helped her. She had been for decades reading about nutrition, different things. She'd go on these binge diets. She'd lose a lot of weight and then gain it back. And each time gain back more and it would be worse the next time. And when she, she read Dr. Furman stuff, the lifestyle change, the logic behind it, the, the nutritional strategies, she knew it was the right path. She made the radical change. And then she got really burdened for me. She began to pray earnestly and cry out to God and ask God to, to give her creative ideas. Because my other problem was uh, I'm bold. I've, I've literally preached to crowds where my life was being threatened and I've done it without hesitation. But if mm -hmm. you put new foods before, no, I, 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 I was like a wimp. I was terrified of new foods. So mm -hmm. I, I was really weak in this way. Mm -hmm. She was praying. I didn't even know how earnestly she was praying. And she knew I'm a walking time bomb. I'm a walking mm -hmm. time bomb. I have high blood pressure. It's, it's the quiet killer. And I'm a walking time bomb. On my end, I was embarrassed by being overweight. Nobody talked to me about it because I'm almost 6'3". I, I carried it a bit better, but... Um, the fact was I, I was obese and I, it bothered me. Now, it was only little by little as years got on that I got as heavy, but I was always 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40, 50 pounds, higher, and then it get, got higher. So I preached a message to myself about acharit, which is the a Hebrew word talking about the final consequences, that the end. And I said, what if the end result of your life is you just get some stroke and you're paralyzed for years, you can't communicate because if you abused your body? Mm -hmm. or, or what? Or where is this going? What happens if you hit 300 or three? You know, where does this end? So I had prayed about this on and off for decades because it bothered me, but I was never willing to make the radical changes that I needed to make. And I mm -hmm. always thought, I'll just cut back on this. I'll cut back on this. I'll cut back on this. And it, it never worked. And, and so what happened was when I got to that point of weariness and I said, I don't know that I can keep up this kind of schedule. That really concerned Nancy. And, and, and something else happened. So I believe it was the accumulation, especially of her prayers and mine mm. added in, where I just sat down with her and I said to her, my plan is not working. That was a code for us. Quick story. Mm. Maybe 15 years earlier, she'd said to me one day, hey, honey, I think you put some weight on. She's just concerned about my health. That was it. Not a vanity thing. Mm. And I said, yeah, I have. But don't worry, I have a plan. She goes, oh, okay. Well, six months go by and she said, hon, I don't think you lost any weight. I said, no, no, I haven't, but I have a plan. And she said, oh, okay. Maybe six months, a year goes by and she said, hon, I think you've put weight on. And I said, no, no, you're right. I, I have, but I have a plan. And she said to me, your plan is not working. So I, I sat her down that night and I said to her, my plan is not working. And she mm -hmm. said, okay. I'm taking control of your diet. No food passes through your lips without my permission. And that was the beginning. Wow. Because she's already been on that journey before you. And she's, she's a total realist. She's a mm -hmm. total truth teller. She hates excuses. And, and she knew the path I needed to take. 
And, and I, I encourage everybody though, be honest with God. Said, I can't do it. I, I, I'm we, I can't do it. I can't do without my steaks every day. I can't mm-hmm. do without my milkshake. I can't, I have to have, be honest and say, God, I need, I need help. And if did you, you have, did you have that moment? I can't, uh, <laughs> moment where you broke down and cried and a realization that you had to make a radical decision. Was it that night? Uh, no, no, it, it was not that night. Here's, here's what happened. And Nancy also urged me to put the I can't story in, in the book. And mm-hmm. for all the readers, her parts, her contributions are by far the best. But, but anyway, so initially I had to renew my mind. So first thing was break the addictions. That was three days. And then after that, the addictions were broken. That, that the deep craving, you have to have it and, and feeling weak and sick. So that disappeared. That's number one. Number two, I, I had to change my mindset. I was not a comfort food eater. I was not a glutton. For example, if if I was going to have a Dairy Queen, Chocolate Blizzard, uh, Chocolate Blizzard Extreme, I would always have the largest, of course. That was maybe 1,500 calories just for that. So I would skip lunch that day to make up for it. You know, I was was disciplined in my bad eating. But what, what happened was this. I processed that food was my reward. I push hard. I'm going day and night as I'm sitting writing for hours at night. I'm going to munch on jelly beans and pretzels. When I'm on this flight overseas, I love the pretzel rolls. I'm going to get as many as they have. When, when I'm at the airport, well, of course I can eat what I want. I'm at the airport. So I realized, you know, you preach all day, maybe a busy Sunday, morning service, night service. You go back to the hotel. Well, I'm not going to watch something unclean. I'm not going to do drugs or drink, but I can eat. So I realized food was the reward built in to everything that I had. It, it, one day it dawned on me as I processed this, I thought as our grandkids were little, why would I want to take them to a, a family friendly movie if I can't have chocolate nonpareils and butter popcorn? And I said to myself, you don't go to the movies with the grandkids for the food. You go to have fun with the grandkids. And I realized, no, food reward is built into everything. So I had to change my thinking mm. that food is the fuel for a healthy life and the healthy life is the reward. Because after all, in the course of a day, wow. in terms of actual hours, how much time do you spend eating? Even your favorite restaurant, your favorite meal, how long is that? But you live 24 seven. So that was the first change. Food is the fuel for a healthy life and the healthy life is the reward. And then my, my coming to the end of myself moment, it's about three weeks into this. Now remember, this lifestyle is no dairy, no flour, no sugar. In those days, I would have a little grilled meat once, once a week. Now I hardly ever have it, even for months. But anyway, mm. so we, we don't have any bad stuff in the house. I, I come home, do my radio show, take a nap, and I got to teach a night class at our ministry school. And I wake up with a craving for something sweet. I remembered, Dr. Furman says, sweet tooth, that's good for fruits, natural sugars that you're having fruits and things. I just need some fruit. I can't find any fruit in the house. Somehow we were just out. So I I think, okay, wait, I got to get to, I got to get to class. I don't, I don't have time to go to the grocery store and walk. Oh, wait, wait, there's a convenience store I'm going to pass on the way to, way to class. Maybe they have some fruit. Now I had never once gone into into a convenience store looking for fruit in my life. Maybe they got like little pieces of watermelon or something. So I go in there, they don't have, it's like, oh gosh, I got to eat something. I need to, I got to teach a class. I thought, wait, there's one more convenience store on the way. I go in there. I can't find anything. I remember Nancy said, don't get juices. They've got all kinds of other sugars and you don't Mm. want them. So I see naked juice. I think maybe this is better. Maybe this is healthier. So I get one of those. I drink half the bottle and I I hit bottom. Now, now literally, literally, I'm sitting in my car. I'm literally five feet from the building where I'm going to go in and teach my class on Jesus revolution. Right. And I, I come to the end of myself and I thought, I can't, I can't do this. I'm, or you're going to live the rest of your life and never have a slice of pizza. You're going to live the rest of your life and never have a bowl of chocolate ice cream. You're going to live the rest of your life trying to find a convenience store with some fruit or, or living on some juice. And suddenly I broke down in the car. This is literally two minutes before class. I am in the car sitting outside crying. God, I can't, I can't, I can't. At the same time, in my mind's eye, 
I saw myself looking down, laughing at me, at the pathetic weakness that I was expressing and realizing this is healthy. You're coming to the end of yourself. God's strength manifest in your weakness. This is, you need to come to the end. I can't. And then his grace will rise. And that was it. I never had a crisis like that ever to this day. I had one or two times where I was like, oh man, I'm at this airport seven hours. And there's nothing here at the whole airport that I can eat. And I didn't plan. I didn't bring my healthy snacks with me and, and so on. And like a little frustrated, but that's it. That one crisis was it. But sometimes we have to go through that. We hit bottom. Mm-hmm. We come to the end of ourselves and then God's grace rises. And I, I'm telling you, I, I've, I, I've, I've ridden that, that supernatural wave. And something I learned early on, like when God set me free from drugs or maybe 20 years ago, set me free from Diet Coke. I became a, a Diet Coke addict and he set me free from that instantly. And other ways where he's intervened in my life. I've learned when he's carrying you, don't play with it. When you're mm. flying, don't play with it. When, when he's giving you supernatural grace, don't play mm-hmm. with it because you don't want, you don't get it all the time. And when you mm-hmm. do, you don't want to abuse it. Wow. That is, wow. I'm already getting convicted thinking about, I just came from Florida the last week and what I just ate on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. If we can go to the Esau mentality. Um, so you, you talked about that in your book about yeah. the Esau mentality. And what do you mean by this Hebrew concept of final consequences? Yeah. So I alluded to it very briefly. Acharit. So I'll talk about that and then come to Esau. The most famous message I've preached around the world where people will come up to me 20 years later, they can't speak a word of English, but they come up to me and they go, Acharit, Acharit. It's something God opened up to me in the Mm -hmm. early eighties when I was teaching a class on Proverbs for the adult Sunday school in our church. And I was reading through the book of Proverbs in Hebrew. And I was struck by the fact that this word Acharit occurred a disproportionately high amount of times there. About one out of every five occurrences of Acharit in the Hebrew Bible is found in Proverbs, which is disproportionate because Proverbs is Mm -hmm. the small size of the whole of the the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. I I knew it, for example, Isaiah 2, Acharit Hayamim, in the end of days. It can mean that. But the, the word, the root comes from a Hebrew word having to do with back, that which is behind, that which comes after. And mm-hmm. the concept is, it's, it's, it's that which you cannot see from this perspective. It's in the distance. It's in the future. It's the end. It's the final consequences. It's the final result. Mm-hmm. So throughout Proverbs, you have these warnings, like Proverbs 19, 20, to listen to counsel so you can be wise in your acharit. Or, or the man in Proverbs 5 who's seduced by the smooth-talking woman, and he doesn't realize her acharit is death. He, he doesn't, and, and now in his acharit, he's groaning as he's dying of some sexually transmitted disease and thinking, well, mm-hmm. I, I destroyed everything. I lost mm-hmm. my wife, I lost my reputation, I lost everything I had, for what? So I've preached that to myself over mm-hmm. the decades. I've preached it around the world, uh, especially in the context of warning about sexual sin, but it's the same with, with drink, you know, Proverbs 23, the wine in the cup, oh, it's so good good goes down. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need that. Or, you know, there's that ad on TV. Oh, I want that. But it says it's acharit, bites like a snake. So uh, that mentality was the very thing Esau didn't have. And he thought, look, uh, what's the good of a birthright in the future when I'm dying of hunger now? Mm-hmm. I need to eat this now. So Satan's thing is always the pleasure of the moment. You need this now. Yeah, you're married, but she's pretty and she's, she likes your jokes. Yeah, you're trying to walk into sexual purity, but look, you need that release now. Just one website, one time. It's the same with us with food. We know it's destructive or we, we put it out of our minds as unhealthy. Many of us are willfully ignorant. I was willfully ignorant. Nancy mm-hmm. would want me to read nutrition books. I said, look, who do you listen to? One day butter's healthy. Now it's margarine's healthy. Now this is good. Now that's good. Here's a vegan guy and he dies of cancer at 30. Who knows? It's just everybody's got a theory. So I was willfully ignorant. But for many of us, we know that, that eating that cheeseburger and large fries and milkshake is not healthy, is not contributing to our well-being, but we want it now. We don't think about the yachari. We don't. Here's a guy eating unhealthily into his 40s and 50s. He's not thinking about the fact that he'll never see his grandkids because he killed himself with unhealthy oh. eating. He's not thinking about the fact that a week before his daughter's wedding, he, he dies of a, of a massive heart attack that could have been prevented 
And, he, and instead of celebrating the wedding, they're all at a funeral. We wow. don't think about that b- because we live in the moment. God's mm-hmm. perspective is always wisdom looks at the acharit. And our perspective is always the pleasure and gratification of the moment. It's deadly. It's destructive. And we always live to regret it. Mm, that's so powerful. That is, that is right there. So powerful. You mentioned also in your book, and I think it's important to allude to this, about Song of Solomon, chapter 215, where it talks about yeah. the little foxes that spoil the vines, you know, and now you mentioned about the naked juice, you know, the little foxes that spoil the vine. Can you speak about that in terms of food? What are some of those little foxes you stayed away at first in the beginning from? And what does it mean in regards to overcoming the stronghold of food? Yeah, well, what you have to do is first, anywhere where there's a stronghold, anywhere where there's an unhealthy habit, you have to, you have to cut it out. You have to cut it off, not cut it back. You know, the the diet mentality is basically you keep cutting back. So you're always frustrated. You're always not having enough. You're you're having enough of the bad to keep the appetite for it alive. You know, think of think of any wrong habit you have. Let's say you're addicted to watching some soap operas, if they still have them on TV, or some some, you know, something that's totally addictive to you. You're addicted to sports and gambling. Oh, I'm going to cut way back. I'm going to cut way back on gambling. I'm going to cut way. B- no, no, no. You got to cut it out entirely. Otherwise, you, you, you leave that thing alive. It's going to come back and bite. That's why Jesus doesn't say if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it back some. No, it's, it's cut it off, metaphorically speaking. So wherever the strongholds are, you have to deal with it radically. And, and then you have to ask yourself, okay, what opens the door to a wrong to a wrong habit. So maybe it's, it's just snacking. Ideally, you don't snack. You eat when your body needs food, and then you learn to just go without it. Sometimes even healthy snacks. Like years ago, I ended up putting on about 20-something pounds over a period of years just by eating too many raw nuts and by eating things instead of chocolate, some healthy stuff I eat that tastes like chocolate to me, but it's, it's just all healthy, just eating too much of that. And I realized I, I, I did not violate any of the principles I did not eat a single bad food, but too much of stuff. So I just had to make that adjustment by God's grace, you know, and so I realized, okay, just walk within these parameters and anything that takes you out of that, look at it as, that's, that's my enemy. And, and then here's the other thing I'd say to this. And, and look, Vlad, we are a Holy Spirit people. So your audience knows that they know you. Some of them know me. I'm not saying this in an empty way, but Vlad, I feel the Holy Spirit on this interview. I feel supernaturally animated by God to talk about these things. What we're saying is true without the Holy Spirit's animation or anointing, but I I sense God on it, Mm -hmm. meaning Mm -hmm. it's really important that you're bringing this up and and that by God's grace, many, many are going to be helped by it. But when I got saved, I was instantly set free from drugs. As I said, before that I'd given up drinking, but I was not addicted to drinking. I would hear people share their story and say, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I'm a recovering drug addict. And I judge them. I judge them as weak and not fully understanding the liberty that we have in Jesus. And that's not who we are. We are transformed. I I still believe ultimately we should not think of ourselves as recovering, but as redeemed and transformed. Mm -hmm. But I realized, especially in the early days, I needed to have the attitude of a recovering food addict. In other words, A recovering alcoholic does not go in a bar, period. You don't go in a bar. You understand Mm -hmm. that. You don't, well, I'm just going to have a drink for my birthday. No, you don't even have a drink ever under any circumstance. When you're at the wedding and they toast the bride and the groom, you put it to your mouth and you put it down, or you stay away from the table entirely because you can't drink it. So I knew I had to have that mentality, at least at the beginning, and now it's Mm -hmm. lifestyle. Under no circumstances do I ever cross that line. Why? Well, what if just eating that one bad thing one time reopens the desire for it? Mm. Big problem. That's number one. Number two, if, if I eat the bad stuff, and this is what Nancy discovered because she fell back and then had to regain her ground. Once you eat the bad stuff, the good stuff doesn't taste good anymore because your food, your, your, your taste change. I love having salad. I love having fruit. I love eating healthy food. Stuff I would have gagged on before, I love eating now. But that can undo it. And and then here's the big one for me. 
if I can find an excuse to eat something unhealthy today, grandkids' birthday in this mm -hmm. country only today, I, you know, just published another book, whatever, I could find an excuse to eat bad any day. So it had to be this radical, rigid line. And not everyone has to live by this, but most people that Nancy and I have encouraged in counsel, the great mm -hmm. majority, they have to live with the either or mentality because the part way most of the time just doesn't work. Wow. Wow. You just, that's, that's so strong. And I think that's, this is so important what you just shared. And in your book and something that I think you just already alluded to this, uh, you mentioned about 10 recommendations for healthy lifestyle. Would you go through them? Yeah. Uh, and maybe how does that apply in your life? So don't diet, get a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I do not diet. I eat differently. I live differently. Good. The dieting mentality, it's yo-yo, it's up and down. And then each time you end up with more fat cells in your body, you end up more unhealthy, more discouraged. Mm -hmm. Secondly, don't cut back on bad foods. Cut them out entirely. Replace wow. them with good foods. So I alluded to that briefly, mm -hmm. but it's not a matter of me having less M&Ms or less milkshakes or less French fries or, or, or less burgers and buns and whatever. It, no, no, it's, it's a matter of don't have. Don't have the things that are unhealthy at all. You know, for mm -hmm. example, uh, married to Nancy going on 48 years, I, that's it. I'm married to her. I'm not married to anyone else. I don't have sexual relations with anyone else. I don't have emotional connection to any other woman because I'm married to her, right? I don't, I don't share that. So, and you know, someone said to me, Jesus is the first of many lovers. He said, my wife wouldn't like that mentality. <laughs> Right. So we, we have to cut the other loves out. And then if you want to get free, that's the only way you're going to get free. Other, uh, otherwise, like a porn addict saying, I'm just going to mm -hmm. only watch porn once a week and, and for less mm -hmm. time. No, no, no. By God's grace, you cut it out. Then, then okay. you can experience freedom. Number three, recognize that food addiction is real and deadly. The, the vast majority of us in America are food addicts in one way or another. Joel Furman had one of his books. You know, do this little survey to see if you're a food addict and, you know, you, you, you hide food secretly. You do this, you know, went through all the different things. You have to have certain things. And maybe there were eight items and I was like three out of eight. I thought that's pretty good. And he said, if you have any one of these, you're an addict. It's like, oops. So it's real and it'll kill you. And, and it'll lead to all kinds of unnecessary diseases and pain and suffering. And, and the younger you are, the less you feel it. But the older you are, you now reap the results of what you did in your younger years. So if you can get it right when you're young, if I'm thriving like this, going on 69, thriving by God's mm. grace in every way, what would have happened if I made these changes 40 years earlier? Who can mm -hmm. imagine? Then uh, next, learn the difference between toxic hunger and true hunger. This is something I only learned through Nancy and Dr. Furman, but a lot of our cravings, when, when I, I need to eat, I want to eat, I feel weak, that's mm -hmm. toxic hunger. That's the food addictions. That's the bad stuff crying out for more. And, and again, I know very little about nutrition, but I knew enough to realize when I fast, I only realized this 10 years ago, when I fasted, I'd always have misery the opening days and headaches mm -hmm. and it's terrible. When I did 21 days on water, the first week was miserable every day, all day. I didn't realize that was because of toxins leading my body. So when I went through the withdrawal, getting rid of the bad foods, I realized, okay, all this bad feeling, yucky, that's the bad stuff leaving my mm -hmm. body. So a lot, of, a lot of our hunger is not real hunger. It's toxic mm -hmm. hunger. Uh, don't snack between meals. Bad habit. Bad yeah. habit. I've fallen into it with healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. And you end up, again, it, it's a lack of discipline. And it opens the door and your body will get used to it. Once you, with God's grace, get in the good habit of eating the meals as you need each day, you get mm -hmm. used to it. It becomes a lifestyle. Recognize unhealthy eating may be a sin to you. Mm -hmm. that, that once you see these things and hear them, you may have to think differently. And I was mm -hmm. at a pastor's breakfast in Queens, New York one time. And I was talking to one of the pastors. I said, it's like we made a deal with the devil to kill everybody young. You just look at what's being served here. Every kind of unhealthy mm -hmm. pork thing and greasy this and mm -hmm. greasy that and heavy calories. It's like, no wonder we're so ineffective. You know, we're mm -hmm. too fat to fly, right? So for many, once you become clear on it, unhealthy eating is sin. Mm -hmm. Identify the main psychological reasons you overeat. For me, as I said, food is my reward. For mm -hmm. others, it's what you do for comfort. 
mm-hmm. for uh, others, you know, aside from gluttony, there can be other psychological, emotional reasons that helps to understand that. Yeah. Understand food, food is the fuel for your life. It's not the reward of your life. It's the mm-hmm. fuel for your life. Realize exor- exercise is not a substitute for changing your food habits. That's good. I worked out heavily. I worked out very intensely when I was fat and I could compete with, with guys younger than me, but mm. th- still, you know, Nancy used to say, you're crazy doing that <laughs> with your, you're, 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 you're going to hurt yourself doing that. So exercise is important, but it's way down the list of what matters. And then lastly, resolve to change today because tomorrow never comes. Maybe the change starts with honest confession to God. I'm weak. Mm. I'm a food wimp. I look, you may be a pastor with a ministry that reaches millions every month and you're a food wimp. Could we, I, I was in, in the eyes of many, a powerful man of God. And I was a slave to my stomach, a slave to sweet, a chocoholic man of God, preaching the gospel, preaching purity, seeing people set free. And I myself was a chocoholic. So that's the reality, but God knows he's incredibly merciful incredibly kind. He used me in my fat days. He uses me in my thin days. It's all his grace, but start today. Realize, okay, I, my plan's not working. Forget the new, I'm going to have to do something radical and I'm not willing start there. I'm God, but I'm not willing or I need help or I don't know the way. Mm-hmm. Start today. Then our, our book, Breaking the Stronghold of Food. We have lots of other recommendations here, free websites to go to or YouTube channels where people will, will talk about it and mm-hmm. healthy recipes here, here are other guidelines. Here's Dr. Furman's literature. And, and then hopefully with our inspiration and, and, and armed with these practical steps, uh, folks, folks can make it. And boy, uh, when I run into people, I was, I was out preaching the other day and a woman came up to me. She said, my husband read your book. It changed his life. He's lost 50 pounds. He's a new man. I was preaching another day, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Pastor says to me, there was a golf pro, heard your message a year ago where I ha- or two years ago where I happened to speak about food, one message. He said mm-hmm. he got so convicted, he was 75 pounds overweight. He's lost the weight. He's a new man. So oh. it's awesome. And, and then I was a type two diabetic. I thought I'm going to die and leave my kids behind. And now I'm healthy and thriving. And yeah, wow. so it's, it's gratifying. Dr. Brown, I'm really yeah. believing that this is going to create a shift in people's lives. You you have a way of shifting things. I remember I was um, re- recalling my convers- my uh, vacation a few years ago, reading your book on I'm Not Afraid of Antichrist. And that changed my perspective on tribulation and that just kind of reworked that. And after that, when I interviewed you, so many people's lives after that, their perspective changed because a lot of this is also a shift in their mind about food. And what is, just a p- p- personal question, what does your eating look like now? What do you eat now? So uh, I normally start late morning because I'm a late night person, uh-huh. but I will either have some fruits or some berries, uh, an apple, uh, maybe uh, a couple of nuts. So I'm very exact in terms of, of what I have with, with raw nuts. Mm-hmm. And then um, a day like that, I'll have uh, a chocolate protein shake. I mean, it tastes like chocolate. It's not chocolate, mm-hmm. uh, protein shake. Uh, other days I may have overnight oats, which I only started doing the last few months. Mm-hmm. Uh, these overnight brownie oats again talks, tastes like chocolate brownie to me, but it's not chocolate in it. So I'll have that and, and then, mm-hmm. and then some fruit. And then uh, late afternoon is, is my, my biggest meal. So I have a, a giant salad. Um, I take like five and a half, six ounces of greens, say romaine lettuce, put that in. Nancy makes cruciferous. So that's like broccoli and kale and, and, you know, cabbages and things like that. I, I put that in and then, you know, tons of tomatoes and cucumber and peppers mm-hmm. and onions and flaxseed, things like that. Um, some, some raw uh, pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, but all, you know, very exact mm-hmm. amounts, but it's, it's in a four, I, I take a four quart bowl and I fill the bowl and then a healthy salad dressing. Uh, I also have no oil in my diet either. Uh, that's a, that's a more recent step that I taken to eliminate mm-hmm. any oils, even from dressings. So a super mm-hmm. healthy dressing in the early days, Nancy would make them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, after that, uh, some more fruit and then like early evening, then I'll have maybe a, a veggie burger. So no oil on, on Ezekiel bread. And, and then something, it tastes like a, a chocolate bar to me, 
but it's like one of Dr. Furman's. It's just, it's, it's super healthy content, you know, sweetened by dates and other things. Or I might make myself a pseudo pizza, uh, which is like on Ezekiel bread pita with a healthy red sauce, uh, almost no sodium in it. And, and then uh, I, I used to use a certain type of fake cheese called dye, but it had oil in it. So I used something else. I think it's called table tasty. It's a powder that tastes like cheese. I may have that and then maybe a few more nuts. And, and, and when and, you travel, do you just bring some food with you? Yeah, yeah. So we tell everyone I'm on a special diet. Mm -hmm. So everyone knows that. I I'll also have like a certain amount of these healthy crackers, but a limited amount, you know, mixed in with some of the meals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I mean, that's the basic life flow. So we tell them I'm on a special diet. We used to tell them to stock my room with, with literally peanut M&Ms, pretzels, and Diet Coke. So now the room is, is stocked with fruits, and, and some, uh, some vegetables and then uh, sparkling water or water. That's all I drink is either sparkling water or mm -hmm. water. And then um, for meals, they'll just have giant salads ready for me. So I travel with my organic raw beans. I forgot to mention that, that I get a lot of protein mm. from that. Organic raw beans with no sodium. I travel with those. I travel with a little strainer that I strain things with. Um, and then I'll, I may bring the healthy crackers with me and some of the healthy nuts. And, and then my, you know, the vitamins and things like that, that I take, wow. you know, the wow. supplements. Yeah. So that's, wow. that's what I travel with. And, uh, when I go on a long trip, like multi, multi day, then, then I'll, I'll have my, um, take a giant salad with me, the healthy snacks. And then maybe one of those days I may have a little meat, you know, grilled meat, if that's what mm -hmm. I can get, uh, you know, one day on the road. Mm -hmm. And it's been, you know, uh, nine and a half years done it literally around the world. In fact, when I first started traveling, when God convicted me to make this lifestyle change, in the months immediately afterwards, I had to go to Singapore, to Hungary, to India, and Malaysia within the next four months, along with all over America. And Nancy oh. would just pack, she made special meals, she freeze, oh, she makes these unbelievably healthy soups, that's the other thing, freezes them. Mm. And mm -hmm. then I'll, I'll have you know a couple of those a week. So I travel with some frozen stuff sometimes if it's overseas in like a container, with little freezer things in it, and then just put it in the fridge when I get where I'm going. So yeah, I have to make choices, but it's easy. It's just, it's total, mm -hmm. it's like packing my bags. Mm -hmm. And think of this, you put a little extra time, a little extra time and effort into your mm -hmm. diet, the energy you have, the life you have, the strength you have, the vitality, your day is so much more vigorous, so much more energized, wow. so much more healthy that you get all that time back 10 times over. Wow, wow. Uh Dr. Uh, Michael Brown, would you just um, say a prayer, yeah. prayer for people who are convicted right now, but they are not in that place right now where they don't feel that they have any strength to make those changes? Yeah. So, Father, I'm so thankful for the mercy you've given me. My only boast is in you. My only boast is in you. You, you intervene in my life and you help me, and it's that simple. So I'm asking you to do the same for others, to intervene in their lives, the, the mental switch that has to happen, the emotional switch that has to, to happen, the, the, the support that they need, the conviction that they need, the guidance that they need, intervene so that every single one that says, I want to live differently, I want to be healthy, I want to be a good steward of my body, that you would give a path for every single one and that you would not stop convicting them in your loving way and reminding them until they get on that healthy path. God, we need your grace. The same grace you gave me, the same grace you gave Nancy. I'm asking you to give to every single one. Give them a spirit of honesty with themselves and with you. And may you set them free for life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir, for your time. And uh, guys, we will attach links to the books to the book of Dr. Michael Brown, as well as some of the links that he made reference to, some of the tests, we will attach them below this video. But if you got convicted, if you got um, touched by the Lord, by the things you've heard, I want to encourage you to get the book. The reason being is that you need to feed that fuel right now, this, this knowledge, so that the Lord can bring a deeper conviction. As what you've heard right now, this is not done in our own strength. This is a stronghold. That's why we call this not for... YouTube clickbait purpose, but it's really a stronghold for many people. You have to do spiritual warfare. You have to know the truth and rely on God. 
So thank you, sir, for uh, joining with me and for writing this book and speaking this message to the rest of to the rest of the world. I really thank you for hosting me, for asking the right questions, for for really preparing for this, and for everyone out there. We we send out inspiration, and encouragement every week. If you don't get my newsletter and our, our information every week, go to the line of fire dot org, the line of fire dot org, our frontline newsletter. We'd love to pour into you, be a blessing to you. And, and know that even though I don't know you that are watching, we carry you in our hearts. We're rooting for you by God's grace that you can do it, you can make it. And, and really thank you, Vlad, for taking the time to do this and, and giving us this platform together. Thank you.